whether it was the bushfires in Australia, whether it was the downing of the plane in Iran, whether it's about the impeachment crisis, whether it's coronavirus, almost every story now has an element of mis- or disinformation connected to it. That's Claire Wardle, the co-founder and U.S. director of First Draft, a nonprofit that trains journalists how to combat mis- and disinformation worldwide. Claire says the problems journalists are confronting overseas rarely get any press coverage here in the U.S. Certainly, the conversations in America do not recognize what this looks like globally. In fact, the conversation seems to be stuck in 2016. While we've been talking about the four-year-old threat of fake news, Claire has been watching whole new categories of threats go unacknowledged. When people would use the phrase fake news, I would say, well, most of this stuff isn't fake and most of this stuff isn't news. If there's anything Claire can teach us, it's that most of these threats are so new we're at a loss for words. How do we deal with a genuine photo that's three years old? It's a genuine photo, it's three years old, but the problem is the caption is placing it in a different context. Lots of research shows that audiences can't even consider that that photo would be three years out of date because they that's not a problem that they've ever encountered. So they don't, they're not prepared to fight it because they don't know it's a thing. But Claire can describe the specific problem. She calls it false context, and that's just one of the seven distinct harms that she's identified in her eye-opening presentation, The Seven Types of Mis- and Disinformation. It's a presentation that takes us into the gray zones of information warfare, where bad actors and their unwitting victims slip between facts and falsehoods, news and gossip, sincerity and satire. They can even share the truth, and nothing but the truth, but still mislead users through the power of narrative and repetition. Bad actors, they understand that they are pushing a particular frame. It could be about illegal immigration. It could be about vaccine. Whatever it is, it's about frames and narratives. And those of us on this side who are trying to push quality information are playing whack-a-mole with these atoms of content. I just think we're not going about this the right way at all. Like this idea, like we're going to fact check a thing. Not how it works. Today on the podcast, Claire Wardle tells us how dis and misinformation really work. Now, keep in mind that we recorded this interview in late February before the coronavirus upended life as we know it. Now that we've all retreated to our homes in this collective attempt to flatten the curve, this conversation about misinformation has never been more important because how we understand what the coronavirus is and how dangerous it is and what we should do and how do we help each other is all mediated on screens. All of us are living on screens. It is the new digital habitat. And so everything we're about to explore with Claire about what needs fixing in our information environment and how our minds really process that information are all the more important to tackle now. One of the the hopeful things here is that Corona is like a tracer bullet moving through our information ecology, and it's a united threat, a united enemy that we can all finally face. So this is the perfect time for platforms to get it under control. So I'm Tristan Harris. And I'm Aza Raskin. And this is your undivided attention. I actually have a PhD in communication and I thought I was going to be professor for the rest of my life. I was researching user-generated content. So how did newsrooms verify content that came in from the audience over email? And so it was a very niche research topic and I thought nothing of it. And then the plane landed in the Hudson River in January 2009 and the head of BBC News Gathering called me and said, not one of our journalists in the newsroom knows what Twitter is. And somebody tweeted a picture of passengers on the wings and we didn't know how to find that picture, how to verify that picture or knew whether legally or ethically we could use the picture. Can you leave academia and help train all of our staff around the world on how to do this? So I called my mum and said, I'm going to leave academia and that nice pension. And so for the last 10 years, I've been traveling the world training people. And then three years ago, the question of how do you verify information online became a thing that a lot of people cared about. I think what's interesting is 10 years ago, I started my career teaching journalists how to find content and how it was going to open up their black book, how they'd be able to get different voices all the things that we loved about this concept of what social media would bring. And now I'm training journalists to say, stop, be really careful. Those sources probably aren't who they say they are. I mean, in 10 years, it has been a 180 degree shift and it's kind of astonishing. And so what woke you up to this shift? You said three years ago, something shifted. What was that? 
So First Draft was founded in 2015 uh, as a project of Google, actually. Google recognized that, that, that journalists were struggling to know how to verify particularly images and videos online. And so First Draft was founded with very little money to say, can you just build a website to help journalists? We taught journalists how to uh, do geolocation on a video. How can you independently assess uh, where something has been filmed? How can you do digital footprinting? How can you look at metadata to understand whether where a photo has been taken? So we still use those same training materials materials now. But back then it was about how can you make sure the material during a breaking news event is authentic? Now it's how do you know that that trending topic is authentic? How do you know that this network of accounts pushing the same material is authentic? So it's the shift again has been quick, but uh, it's using the same tools. When I first met you, I think it was in 2017, right after um, the election. It was at MIT, the Media Lab's fake news conference. Oh, yeah, the misinfocon. And one of the things I really appreciated uh, in a world of simplicity and black and white thinking was your first desire to say, wait, hold on a second. How do we actually define an ontology, a framework for saying what's the difference between misinformation, disinformation, and these even new proliferating types of, you know, fake hashtags, fake trending topics, all these kinds of things. Do you want to just quickly take a moment and define some of these distinctions? Because the word fake news, as we all know, is, is really unhelpful. And we want to have a dialogue about what the deeper stuff is. Yeah. And I think if I'm being honest, this goes back to my academic roots. I mean, I'm glad that I did my PhD, but it taught me to think about language and to think about terminology. And so I remember in my bedroom, it was kind of like November 2016, just after the election. I remember with post-it notes being like, well, here's an example. That's this. That's this. And I kind of created a typology with post-it notes. And at that conference, I remember putting up the seven types types of mis and disinformation as kind of like a testing ground. And somebody tweeted it, as people do at conferences, and Brian Stelter from CNN picked up the tweet and put it on reliable sources. And since then, this kind of typology has taken on a life of its own. And whilst I don't think it's perfect, it can definitely be built on, what it did was make people recognise that this isn't about truth and falsity. So the seven types starts with satire, which interestingly, lots of people said, oh, Claire, satire is a form of art. You can't include that. Well, now we see satire used deliberately as a ploy to get around the fact checkers. So what's an example of that? Uh, so we saw this uh, a couple of weeks ago with the Bloomberg clip where he slowed down the debate, which made it look like when he said, I'm the only person on stage that has run a business. And they sl- they basically went from candidate to candidate with reaction shots where they look stumped. Huh. And he added chirping crickets as a kind of way of saying, look, nobody could answer my question. Right. And then when people pushed back and said, that is a false video, that's disinformation. He quite rightly said, it's not disinformation. I was trying to make a point and I was using satire as a technique. Got it. So that was satire. Yeah. Or we just see people label a piece as satire. It could be Islamophobic, for example. And when people push back, they're like, we're making fun of people who are Islamophobic. So satire is now something that we see as a tactic. Things like false connection. If you have a clickbait headline, the idea that you're taking somebody to a piece of content that doesn't deliver what it was promised, I argue that's a form of polluting the information environment. You call that false connection. Yeah. And then we talk about misleading content. We've seen this for years in tabloid newspapers, the using statistics in a way that's trying to slant something, you know, bias through omission, you know, all the techniques that we've seen around misleading content. We then talk about false context, which is genuine information, but used out of context. Say there's an earthquake tonight in Chile and I go and Google it. And the first thing that comes up is an image of an earthquake, but it was three years ago in Iran and I'm like oh my goodness what a picture and I share that on Twitter and I'm like I can't believe this earthquake it's genuine but it's used out of context Mm. so it it was true about a different thing and so the context has been collapsed exactly we're seeing a lot of the coronavirus rumours are actually genuine photos of people with face masks from previous times It's the easiest form, but most effective, because as we know, the most effective disinformation is that which has a kernel of truth to it. Why fabricate something when I've got something already that I can recaption? So that's false context. We then talk about imposter content, which is when people use logos or names. So maybe a journalist that they trust, that name gets used to sell soap or as part of a propaganda campaign. So this is the Pope endorses Donald Trump? Yeah. 100%. Uh Um, But in that example, you'd probably, you'd need the Vatican logo. Like you'd need Ah, something that like, it's, you know that it's, or you're led to believe that it's official. Right. And then we talk about manipulated content, which might be... Would you also include an impersonated content, like if someone starts a Twitter account called Tristan Harris 1, and so it looks almost like my Twitter account, 
um, or the real Tristan Harris, yeah, right? Because they're using your credibility, right? And again, as we're scrolling through Twitter, it's very easy to create. I'd, I'd write Tristan with a one as opposed to an I. Right. That's what I would do. Yeah. Um, so and then and that's what people do with these like phishing attack type type absolutely. things. Is that the characters look almost identical, the one and the I. When Donald Trump confirmed Gina Haspel, who's the CIA director, the first response to his tweet was a was a fake account called Gina Haspel One or something like that. And it was just, thank you, Mr. President. I'm so excited for the job. But it was, I think, a Russian bot or something. Yep. And the name was almost identical to Gina Haspel, but it was just had one character off. Yep. And people, you know, wouldn't know. No, exactly. And that's, I mean, when people, I'm sure we will talk later about deep fakes, but whenever I have a conversation with someone, I'm like, why am I going to spend the money and the time to do that when look what I can do by putting a one as opposed to an I? I mean, there are too many ways to game the system right now with very little um, work. And so then the last two are manipulated content. So imagine I have two genuine photos spliced together. So we have an example actually uh, that uh, did very well just before the 2016 election of it looks like people waiting to vote at a polling station and there is a guy being arrested by ice and he's wearing his ice jacket and we use it in training all the time because I have to say well what, what do people think of this photo and they look at it and they're like oh and then after about 30 seconds they're like oh I think it's false because everybody's looking down at their phone and I'm like yes because this is a genuine photo from earlier in the year during the primaries here is a genuine photo of somebody being arrested by ice you put the two of them together with photoshop it takes two seconds but if your worldview is believing that illegal immigrants are voting why are you going to stop to make you, well of course that doesn't quite fit or the shadows don't quite go in the same direction so manipulated is taking something that's genuine and you know, changing it or splicing it together. Again, much easier than starting from scratch. And then the final bucket is fabricated content. So that's the 100% completely false, Pope endorses Donald Trump, deep fake, something that's completely, you know, comes from nowhere. If I'm a bad actor, that that's my least favorite of the seven buckets hmm. um, because I haven't tested it. I don't know whether people are going to believe that rumor. I'm going to have to spend money to fabricate a video, you know, why am I going to do it? So of all those seven buckets or types, uh, the thing that we see the most of is this false context, which is genuine content used out of context. Right. And then what is the difference in your official definition between misinformation and disinformation? Just so people have that. Yeah. So disinformation is false information that is created and shared to cause harm. Misinformation is also false information, but the people sharing it don't realize it's false. So we see a lot of that during breaking news events where people see something, they don't know it's false and they share it trying to be helpful. But actually, we have become weaponized and that if we didn't share, if we were more thoughtful and slowed down all the things that you talk about, we wouldn't have so much of a problem. But in this whole space, the number of bad actors who are really trying to cause harm is small. The problem is us. And because the bad actors are very good at making us do this by taking advantage of our fears, emotions, all the stuff we're probably going to talk more about, then it, it really works. So one thing listeners should know is just when I think of Claire, I think of someone who is on an airplane flying <laughs> between election to election, like swinging in with a cape. You kind of have this like SWAT team that you bring in to try to prepare news organizations in different countries around certain information concerns. What's an area of harm that you think is underappreciated and what are some of the kind of alarmist concerns that have been over appreciated just to kind of calibrate like the public debate about this topic it focuses on fake news and then the russian bots yeah and so that's kind of like we would if you were drawing out a continent map you would think that's 80 percent or something of the problem i don't know yep. just something like that but then the actual map if the map is not the territory yeah you know, what what is what is kind of where should our concerns be so it's a great question because because we obviously work globally and I feel very lucky to do that because when you spend any time in the US, the focus is almost entirely about political disinformation on Facebook. The reality, the rest of the world, it's health and science misinformation on closed messaging apps. Mm. I think the coronavirus has made people recognize that this is much more complex. It impacts so many different topics. You said closed messaging apps, by which we mean WeChat, WhatsApp. Um... Yeah, Line, Kakao Talk, Telegram. And yes, there are some differences country to country and slightly different technologies. But the biggest learning is all of this is about human psychology. Mm -hmm. What works in Brazil works in America. And it's all about tapping into human fears. It's about tapping into in groups and out groups. And it doesn't matter whether it's Nigeria and it's a country split between two religions or India. I mean, and that's, to be honest, it's on one hand, you it makes it easier to understand. But the other hand, it's kind of depressing because you realize that it's kind of technology agnostic and it's about technology activating the worst. Right. And so 
Do you want to give people a little bit of a hint of some of the places you've been and uh, how these things have showed up you know, around the world? So after November 2016, as you can imagine, there was much more concern about uh, this globally. And just after the election, actually, we held some partner meetings with newsrooms, uh, two in the US and one in London, actually, with European partners. And French journalists said, you know, we're about to go into an election. Uh, we're concerned, based on what we've just seen, that we're not ready in France. And so we worked with French partners to work on a collaboration with over 30 newsrooms who said, we don't think we can do this alone. We want to work together. So this is the election that ultimately Macron had won? Yeah, May 2017. So, And in that, we tested this new methodology, which we called cross-check. Our belief is that no newsroom should compete when it comes to disinformation. Because really, journalists have never had to deal with falsity. That stuff ended up on the cutting room floor. What now is happening is the audiences are saying, well, yeah, we, we also care about the truth, but can you help us navigate what's false? I want people to understand this innovative strategy that you came up with, which was in an environment where there's media that is highly polarized, where the public doesn't trust different newspapers. And now let's say there's this new false information story that comes like comes down the pike. Yeah. And if one of the, let's say, the CNN of the of France yeah. says that's not true, if CNN of France doesn't have credibility, people aren't going to trust them yeah. shooting that story down. Yeah. And so the innovative approach that you came up with is when you go into a country, whether it's France or Brazil, what if we got all the news organizations together because people would trust it if like 30 different newspapers all said that this isn't true? Yeah. So we did this project in France. And what we realized is that journalists working together was this kind of amazing moment where people were teaching one another skills, et cetera, et cetera. And so we now have rolled that out in places like Nigeria and Brazil. And we've worked with journalists in Australia and Myanmar. And that's an interesting in a moment to relate it to one of our earlier conversations with Rachel Botsman on the erosion of trust in society. In a low trust world, people don't trust those who are even providing the corrections. So yeah. we're kind of I sort of see ourselves as a as a global civilization running around trying to just grab the last tiny little bits of trust that we have in our institutions. Like what does have authority to shoot down that something that might not be true? Yep. And I see you as finding this kind of nonlinear effect that if we got these 30 newspapers to shoot it down, that might yeah. do something. Yeah. And I actually have to correct. I don't know. People know this, but um, First Draft is one between myself and my sister. She's mm. based in London. Oh, I didn't know that. And um, she came up with this cross-check methodology. And Jenny doesn't come from a newsroom background. And she said to me one night, she was like, I think what we should do is get newsrooms to cross-check each other's work. And I said, can I just introduce you to newsrooms? This is never going to happen. They are not going to collaborate. Nice try. But and she was just like, I don't care. Like this is we're in a moment of crisis. We have to do it. And I think it's another reminder of innovation comes from not having that sense of it will never work. And so the the very smart thing in France is in the same way as here where people don't trust, you know, the beltway or elites. In France it's the same thing. Lots of people in France say I don't trust the Parisian media. And so we had a coalition of yes, Le Monde and France 24 and what you would expect, but we also had uh, Strasbourg 89. We had local newsrooms um, who were also in the coalition. So not only did they get to work with Le Monde and some of the big players, but they were much closer to their audiences and is the same as the case here, people are still more trusting of local news because they're more likely to know the journalist. They feel like it's more connected to their lives. And so when we did the evaluation of the project, surprise, surprise, some people said, you know what, didn't trust half the people in your coalition, but I do trust my newsroom. And to be fair, I'm pretty right wing. And I think the Parisian media left wing. And I didn't love everything that Crosscheck did, but I trusted that because I trusted my news outlet. And that was when we had this moment of no one organization is trusted by everybody, but is there a way that we can think about coalitions that might help audiences navigate this and recognize, well, maybe if we've got 10 different logos, then maybe people there is maybe there is something to this. And it's not easy. And, and people sometimes label this as cabals and newsrooms shouldn't work together. And this is collusion. But right now we need to try whatever we can. And I think we did this in France. We did it in Brazil and had very similar feedback. I think there is something to this. Whether we can do it in the US for me is that's the big challenge for me in 2020. But the thing I think I find most interesting about this strategy is this wouldn't appear to naked eyes like it would work because you have these newsrooms that are competing with each other and they're Absolutely. on opposite sides of the political spectrum. Yeah. And you said, no, actually, there's this kind of common good we need to protect here, which is the shared basis of, of truth and facts. And surprisingly, they were willing to sign up for it. 
Yeah, and I think this was because their newsrooms are very frightened about making mistakes. And I think there were many newsrooms that said, we don't necessarily have the skills in house and uh, we can't resource this. And particularly at the at the smaller local level. But I think that competition piece is, and I can't do a French accent, but somebody said like, there's no scoop in a debunk, you know, yeah. like an amazing French accent. But what they were trying to say is, yes, we compete, but we compete again around the good stuff, about the, the investigations, stuff. not, you yeah. know, cleaning up a internet you know right. i mean excuse my language we're but i think cleaning up with our br- we're not competing on brooms we're competing yeah. on exciting explosive material yeah and we should and you know and to be honest media has always had a pool system you know particularly in tv news you don't send everybody with a camera to follow the president or the queen one newsroom goes and then they share the footage and that there was that belief which is on this why are we all wasting time chasing why are we all verifying the same meme on twitter when actually one person can do it we can all look at the reporting and be like yeah we agree right. and that's that's how it worked so it actually worked that way. So there's a sort of a feed or something like that. And then one news organization says, this is a thing we think is a correction. And the others can quickly validate it as opposed to yeah. everyone trying to research it from yeah. 20 Because when you're sides. checking the evidence, it's much quicker than starting from scratch. And to be fair, we saw many times when someone was like, yeah, but actually we're not going to run it unless you actually get a quote from that person or we're, you know, we're still not 100% certain. So it slowed down the process, but it also meant there were absolutely no mistakes on any of the projects we've run now. And when you talk to journalists afterwards, they would say, it made me feel uncomfortable that I was forced to slow down. But surprise, surprise, when I was forced to slow down, it meant that the reporting was more accurate, was stronger, and we didn't make mistakes. Like that's ultimately what we want. I feel like this is something that as consumers of media and information, we also have to gain a tolerance for. Like, it's almost like sugar what's going on, right? Because sugar just gives us that immediate hit and we like it. But then we all know we'd be better off if we just probably didn't have as much. And we've been, you know, sort of tasting this immediate access to there's a breaking news story, Parkland shooting. I want to know in the next 30 seconds what the first report is of whether they know who the gunman is. Yep. But do we actually need to know that? No. And how many how many and which human beings on planet Earth when that happens? If you had to draw like a distribution curve, like how many people needed to know that within the first even let's say 24 hours? Did it actually consequentially affect our lives? And I say this because I think we're in this uncomfortable tension. We have to trade some things. Like right now we say, well, we want that immediate access to whether the coronavirus killed exactly 57 people or the next hour is it 58 people? And like, and I was checking the news this morning on coronavirus. I'm very interested and concerned. But I, I guess it's just like, what's the humane clock rate in which information is dispensed? Because if we want the fire hose, we're going to live in this hyper noisy environment that may not be so bad if it's not consequential, but when it's about whether or not you're going to go into quarantine for a month and lock yourself up with food or whether or not you're going to go you know, inside because you're worried there's a Las Vegas shooter, this just doesn't work. So how, how do you see this tension resolving? I mean, I felt this on the evening of the Iowa caucus, which was, of course, that lots of mistakes happened. But seeing the media in that role was like, if there was no expectation that you would get the results for another 48 hours, right. as is the case just with the Irish election, it took three days. And there was this sense, we'll never, you know, it, that's how long it takes. We also have to think about the political economy here is it's very easy to wag fingers at the media. I mean, Right now, the reason that people are so competitive and that every second counts is because they are desperate for clicks because they're desperate for money and many newsrooms are struggling. But what that means is people are rushing and when a mistake happens, people are recognising that the speed cannot, you know, we have to slow down. We are being approached by more newsrooms to do more training because standards and ethics editors are like, yep, we cannot afford a mistake, not this year. And I think it's not in anybody's interest to be quick. Let's talk about the cost of mistakes, because I know something in in cognitive science, there's an effect. It's basically the first person to frame the debate wins because you you set the initial frame. Yeah. Let's say it's um, you hint that the shooter was actually this kind of disturbed military person. Yep. I don't know. I'm making it up. Yeah, yeah. Now your mind is setting up an evidence accumulator. So your mind is pre-tuned to find and want to confirm and affirm evidence of that specific explanation, which might be different than like, I don't know, something totally different happened yep. that had nothing to do with military, nothing to do with that yep. kind of gun. But that other kind of evidence doesn't have the same or neutral acceptance by the mind because the yep. mind has been pre-framed by the first frame. Yeah. And I think when we think about the cost of misreporting those mistakes, it's like people don't trust the corrections. You kind of entrench yourself 
just not fully, but in a, in a deeper way in the first explanation. Yep. No, and there's, I mean, so much literature from social psychology about effective ways of debunking and issuing corrections. But we know it's really difficult. And we know even when you do it well, people are much less likely to share the correction. And even if you hear the correction, if you get asked two weeks later, you're more likely to be like, oh, I can't quite remember, but there was something, no smoke without fire. And you tend to go to the, the original, original claim. Exactly. And this like, is a yeah. Brioni Swire Thompson's yeah. research at uh, Northeastern University. Yeah. I love it. It's just that people end up going back to the original belief. But so talk about corrections. You've learned a lot about on an elections. You know, what what kind of corrections and what are the cognitive strategies for producing an effective correction yeah, so, in the human mind? So from doing the work that we've done, one concept that we've come up with is this idea of the tipping point. So if you go searching for false information, you will always find it. If I go searching for some conspiracy Facebook groups with anti-vax content, I will find it. If I go looking on 4chan, I will find all sorts of things. Now, it's very tempting, going back to political economy, if I want a headline that's going to get a ton of clicks, there's a ton of that stuff that I could write a piece about and I would get clicks. But of course, if you're a mainstream media outlet, you are giving oxygen to these rumors and conspiracies. So we talk about the tipping point to say, well, if you if you report too early, you're giving oxygen to something that you shouldn't do. But at the same token, if you wait too late to report on these rumors and conspiracies, it's almost impossible to bring it back. But there's this sweet spot, which from our work in um, these election projects, if you get it at the right moment and you get enough newsrooms at the same time, time pushing out responsible headlines, we have seen evidence of slowing down the misinformation or having that misinformation taken down. But that tipping point is something that's really crucial. So this is an example for France, but I think it's a powerful one, which is we saw a very sophisticated hoax website that looked identical to Le Soir, which is a Belgian newspaper. And in fact, every hyperlink clicked back to Le Soir. But the headline was saying that Macron was funded by Saudi Arabia. Explosive content, we, you know, of course, did very quick reporting and found out this was not true. Looked like there were some bots in Tehran that were pushing it, blah, blah, blah. We were like, if we report on this, it's irresponsible. But we sat on it and everybody was briefed. Everybody had the reporting. We didn't do anything about it until Marie Le Pen's niece, who was the niece of Marie Le Pen who was running, she tweeted it. And the tweet of that link meant that it suddenly passed the tipping point. And so then collectively, Crosscheck issued the report and we were able to slow it down and get that taken down. Now, again, that's the perfect example. I use it in training. Everybody loves it. But the concept of that, which is how do you measure the tipping point? How are you sensible about that? There is evidence that you can slow this down. But that's part of our training with newsrooms to get them to think critically about when to report on disinformation. They should not be giving oxygen to everything. It's like the thing they say about timing and comedy is like timing and corrections. It, yeah. You're essentially saying, hey, look, we actually sat on this correction. We knew we had it, but this wasn't the right time to do it. Then it suddenly spikes because of a natural organic event, which is Marina yeah. Penn's daughter uh, or niece. niece, yeah. niece. Uh, post it and you jump on it. A lot of the psychological theory also talks about the power of familiarity and repetition. So again, when newsrooms are being trying to be distinctive and they're competing, you don't have that familiarity and repetition. But if you see a number of different outlets pushing out corrections using similar language, sim- similar imagery, which makes editors go, oh, that's not what we do, Claire. But actually, this is the new public service that is kind of unfortunately required of newsrooms, which is to help audiences navigate our polluted information environment. And in that environment, we have to think differently and like familiarity and repetition work. And that's not what the news industry is about. This reminds me of George Lakoff's work on if you're issuing a correction or if, you're, if, if you see something false and there's different ways of reporting on it, put it into a truth sandwich. So yep. you first say truth sandwich, like two loaves of bread and then something in the middle. You first say the truth. Then you say the false thing that goes against that truth. Then you repeat the truth yep. at the end. Because if you just think about it in terms of quantities and repetition, yep. you said the truth two times and you said the false thing one time. So if you just add that up, you're, you're fixing it. One of our listeners in a past episode uh, on, on hate speech said that one solution, if there's a, a hate campaign that's later found out, to also provide deterrence on future hate speech, is if you say to any poster of, of deeply hateful material, if we discover your hateful content, we will later go back to everyone who saw the hateful content and we will back post twice as much positive content about the same minority group that you were posting about. So we just kind of like changing the saliency and repetition rate of the other positive story. Yeah. And I mean, this goes to the core of a lot of training we're doing right now with journalists, which is how do you word headlines? Because in a headline with 40 characters, you don't have 40, you don't have the chance to do that truth sandwich. So a lot of the evidence is where possible lead with the truth. You know, Brian E. Swire Thompson will say, you know, in the nut graph, you can talk about the falsehood because next to it, you can talk about the truth. But the challenge is in the headline, we shouldn't really be repeating the falsehood in the headline. However, if I'm a journalist, I'm going to say immediately, Claire, have you heard of SEO? Search engine optimization. Uh, 
I have to repeat the rumour in the headline, otherwise I won't get any traffic. So this is kind of a really fascinating question for search engines, which is, I'm out there telling journalists, be really careful, try not to repeat the rumour in the headline, because you're actually reinforcing and giving more oxygen to the rumour. And in an era where lots of people just see the tweet, just read the headline, and they don't read the nuance, we have to be really careful. Yet, I've got journalists who've said, Claire, my newsroom has spent a fortune on search engine optimization training, and we've been told we have to replicate the exact rumour in the headline to get the traffic. And the reason for that, right, is because for someone who's doing a search query about the false thing, they want to be found. Is there no setting where Google can say, essentially, here's a set? I mean, they have these like meta tag names, right, where you can say these are other search terms for this article and take them as seriously as as these other ones. And only authorized journalism outlets can use these meta tags so that Google has can privilege them in some kind of high authority type of way. Yes, can you make that happen? Um, I mean, I'm not joking. I mean, this is this is happening every day in training rooms that we're doing. Really? We also talk to journalists about the difference between people searching versus stumbling upon. So uh, you're absolutely right. If there are rumors about coronavirus, people are typing that into Google. Right. And we want that data void filled with something that responds to that. But at the same time, I don't want somebody stumbling on Twitter over a tweet that's repeating a rumor that I hadn't even heard of something that I should even be concerned about because our lizard brains remember the falsehood. So this is much more complex than these platforms are designed to respond to. Um, but that I would love to have a conversation with Google, which is like, how can we flag the fact that this piece of content should be connected to a rumor without basically repeating the rumor repeating everywhere rumor. through yeah. it just to get the traffic? You're talking to a set of listeners who are often in the tech industry or around in the surround sound of people in the tech industry. What, what do you really wish that they were doing or could do to help you more? So by working globally, I also have huge sympathy with these companies who need global responses in order to scale the work that they're doing. I used to work for the UN and every year you had to change roles and move countries. Like I wish there was more of that in Silicon Valley mm-hmm. because many of these companies tend to be in northern countries. They tend not to be lower middle income countries. And so many of the challenges here, whether they're linguistic, whether they're ethnic, whether they're religious, whether they're the different types of technology, whether they are the different conspiracies that have existed in these cultures for years, that so much of that requires on the ground knowledge. But could they even, I mean, even with your work, so there you are, you've aggregated the 30 different newsrooms in France. The volume of things that are coming through the pipe like trillions of content items. Are these matched? Is there just as many hoaxes and conspiracy theories as there are capable journalists waiting to pick up the phone to then shoot down the rumor? Or like what kind of asymmetric you know, situation are we talking about? Yeah, so for, let's take Brazil for, for his example. It's a huge country. Their news industry is struggling more than this one. They, almost every newsroom has a paywall. So if I'm in Brazil, here's my choices. I either can pay money to get access to a quality newspaper, well, I can't really afford that, or my WhatsApp and Facebook, because of free basics, means that I don't even have to use up data costs to access WhatsApp and Facebook. What am I going to do? I'm going to go to WhatsApp where all of my friends are sharing screenshots of uh, of news sites. So this is something people don't know, I think, our listeners, and I, I, you know, I'm not fully aware of. So people are sharing screenshots of news sites because they'd actually have to pay money, which they don't have, yeah. the, the vast majority of people. Uh, to look at news sites. And this is because of the Free Basics program, which to quickly catch up those listeners who don't know, was a program that Facebook used to say, hey, you can get a a cell phone. And so long as Facebook and WhatsApp basically are the internet for your cell phone, it comes with it on the cell phone, then you get the internet, quote unquote, for free. But then that privileges in terms of usage the WhatsApp and the face and Facebook as the internet. Those are the yep. primary surface areas yep. through which people get their information. Yep. And you know, the number of people who are sharing screenshots of news, let's just be honest, small. The number of people who are sharing memes and old images that are used out of context. Oh, false context visuals. So for yes. example, during the Brazil election, the number we had a WhatsApp tip line, we received over two hundred thousand tips from the public about things they were seeing that they wanted help working out. The number one piece of content that was shared was a photo of a truck with what looked like a ballot box open in the back of the truck and the caption was these ballots have already been pre-filled in for her dad it was a genuine photo but the caption was false that was not true but it was shared everywhere it's visual do you know how widely it was shared i mean we received it we received it over 1500 times on our tip line so it was the number one piece of content but again lots of these countries you have lower literacy levels you have people who have never had email addresses they are for the first time they've got their smartphones all, all the stuff that we know, we had to learn not to take scam 
emails from Nigeria seriously, all the stuff, you know, we can laugh about it, but it's taken us 20 years to kind of figure some of this stuff out. We were actually at a conference in Singapore hosted by uh, Google who had bought amazing people from Malaysia and Myanmar and like, I mean, they were these amazing people doing the same work that I do on a daily basis. And I remember the first hour, there was kind of like seven minute lightning talks. And by the end, I was almost in tears because there was just incredible story after incredible story. And I mean, people saying I'm a mum, but I do this as a fact checker because I just really care. But I see a lot of content now that makes it difficult for me to sleep. I want people in Silicon Valley to hear these stories. What I think is interesting about this is that from the outside, Facebook or Google or YouTube can say, look, we're hiring all these civil society groups. We're paying these fact checkers. You know, we're actually doing all the work with every single nonprofit on the ground in Myanmar, in the Philippines, in Cameroon. What do you want us to do? I mean, we're now working with all the groups that have those resources and have that local expertise. But then what ultimately that amounts to is conscripting them into a feed of essentially like the worst parts of society. I think the biggest counter argument from those who are in the tech industry is like, yeah, we know there's some bads, but there's also just all these goods. And so there's some goods, there's some bads. Who's to say, you know, or we think that basically that's those goods are enough to justify this. One way we could talk about whether the good balance sheet compares to the bad balance sheet is we could say, well, how often are the goods happening and how often are the bads happening? So that's one way to do it, right? You could do it based on volume, like how much of the good is happening. A different way to do it is on consequences. What are the consequences of the good things that are happening? And what are the consequences of the bad things that are happening? Because if fake news, I think in in Brazil, it was something like 89% of the people who voted for Bolsonaro had believed in at least one of the top 10 fake news stories. Uh, They were like complete crazy, like out there fake news stories. If the consequences of the bad are authoritarianism rules the world because elections are debased and what people believe as the basis of their thinking. When your brain is believing some basic set of cognitive frames and beliefs about the world and other people and the politicians you hate, and then on top of that, your mind is looking for evidence to confirm what you already believe, if that's the cost of the bats, that's a highly consequential set of bats. I would argue that's a dark age entering set of bats, yeah. especially in these vulnerable countries where we just shut it down. Like, I mean, I, I sometimes just say, do we really need this? Is this really helping? Or is there a safe way where just, hey, look, can we just do one-on-one messaging? Yeah. And that's it. Because anything more than that is is just actually too damaging. It's too consequential. Well, I mean, I think the the good-bad debate is, as you're saying, is is way too simplistic. And actually, what we're doing here is we're experimenting with people's lives in in a way that we can't stop the snowball. And I'm having a conversation with a Facebook engineer a a year or so ago, and I'm saying, you know, I'm a social scientist by training, and what I worry about is we don't have longitudinal analysis. So we've got psychological experiments right now, mostly done with students in large Midwestern American universities deciding whether or not a corrections policy works. And if so, Facebook has flags or doesn't have flags. One of my heroes is Afuma Azoma. She's a public policy manager at Pinterest. She said, I don't want people searching for vaccine information on Pinterest until we know know what the impact is why should we have it on our platform and we're going to make that decision and my worry is exactly to your point when people are scared they are more likely to be supportive of authoritarian leaders because they're terrified and the strong man you know this is a George Lakoff stuff like you want the strong father figure so if you are terrified in Brazil about the fact that corruption has completely changed your country you you have less money in your pocket because you haven't dealt with the impact of the 2008 financial crisis Bolsonaro looks like a pretty good deal in that situation same with Duterte you could argue the same with other leaders and so what I think we don't understand is this drip 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 piece and to your point about um, consequences we don't know and so I'd rather that we stepped right back and we we tested some of these things without being like oh god in 15 years time we're going to say what the hell did we do and it doesn't mean shut off like the entire internet or shut off www dot like again that's a different thing than let's create viral amplification of the fastest least checked most friendly to bad actor type of speech for example Facebook live I remember at the time knowing people at Facebook who were kind of saying, hypothetically, what if we created a tool that allowed people to just live stream from their kid's birthday party? Wouldn't that be great? Of course, any journalist or foreign correspondent would be like, I'll tell you what will happen immediately. (laughs) It's going to be terrorists. It's going to be suicide. And they went to a dark place. And Facebook was like, no, I think it's going to be about birthdays. You know, it didn't take very long for Facebook Live to really be deranked as a as a tool within the Facebook ecosystem because people realized it was too difficult to moderate and bad actors or for different reasons it was going to look bad. And that's how I feel now, which is, can we look at all of the features, all of the tools, pull back on the stuff that we know 
is potentially going to have more consequences and really go go with the bits that we know and have been tested to really and I know this is very simplistic but I think that there's so much experimentation and things like more friction which we know from all of the research is one of the best ways of slowing this stuff down more heuristics more labels whatsapp gives me give me more stuff to give me that context we know some of this stuff that works and so what I would love to see is more of that less jazz hands about everything's going to be great if silicon valley engineers could spend more time in the pub with foreign correspondents and journalists i think we'd be in a better place because you need some dark some people who've experienced the darker sides of the world to say i'm sorry like this is how your platform is going to be weaponized you're always laying out so many things and i just want to double click on several of them um one was the fear strongman based thing i remember Brittany kaiser who was on this podcast said that in Cambridge Analytica's um, psychological targeting, that one thing they found was that people who have the psychological characteristic of neuroticism always respond to fear. It was only fear that really had a massive impact. So they spent the rest of the super PAC's money on fear, yes. And we have a click-based system. It's a lizard brain enhancing system and fear always works. It's a two-step process from when you're more fearful in general of coronavirus, of you know what Russia could do to this country, of you know whatever it is, what a foreign power you're going to go with the strong guy. So if you just think about it that way, that you have this system that rewards fear over calm yep. truth, then it's sort of obvious to see why you would get kind of authoritarian people everywhere all at once. And to your earlier point, you know, this is the largest unregulated psychological experiment <laughs> done in history. Yeah. Where's the, you know, the, the IRB review board? Where Where's the people who said who could be hurt by this experiment? I mean, I remember back at, at Stanford, you know, if you wanted to do study with 10 people, you had to go through this incredible process to yep. even run the experiment. And in those IRB processes, you have to go through extra steps if you're researching vulnerable people. Right. And I think about that in the global context, which is who are vulnerable? Well, people who are newer to technology, people who have lower literacy levels, you know, we know, we know it. And I think that's my frustration is that there hasn't been a recognition that we want to scale globally. And, you know, yes, many countries have been transformed by this. And that's an important thing to remember, of course. But I don't think there's also been that recognition of there are vulnerable communities here, um, the communities that have been ripped apart or have religious tensions, which mean you've already got this like tinderbox. That's how I feel. Like there are many countries in this world who I would deem as a tinderbox. And for me, this technology is the spark. Right. What worries you about how governments are responding to this, especially the countries that are tinderboxes or more vulnerable? What are governments doing? What are you seeing that works? What do you wish they were doing? So I am very concerned. We've seen the passing of some pretty problematic regulation. Who writes this stuff? Politicians who are actually terrified that they will lose an election because of disinformation. So they are not neutral actors here. And I can understand why there is this, there's been this kind of you know, panic about it globally. And so they want to be seen to be doing something. But again, I'm a social scientist. We should not be doing any of this unless we have a foundation of empirical evidence. And we have almost nothing. If I was to say how much disinformation or misinformation as distinct categories is there? How is it different around the country? Are any of these solutions slowing anything down? Like, Where's the benchmarks? I can't tell you how much of this stuff is out there and what impact it's having on society. And it's now 2020. And most people inside the platforms couldn't say this either. And most social scientists can't say either because we don't have the data because it's inside the platforms. But in that context, no government should be passing any regulation because we don't know how much of it is out there and what impact it is having. What I would love to see governments do is hold the technology companies to account to say, in order for us to have responsible regulation, you are going to need to work with us to allow us to audit what you're doing. We did some work last year around auditing what people saw when they searched for vaccines on Instagram, YouTube, Google and Facebook. And we paid people in 12 countries to send us screenshots. Mm. We got over, you know, 500 screenshots. Beautiful. Because the, you didn't have a way to get that data yourself. No so other you, way to so see. you paid in 12 different countries. People, people to send us screenshots. Mm. That's an audit. Now, that's what I would like to see governments do. And I understand right now we, we see this tension between academics saying to the platforms, give us all your data. And quite rightly, the platforms are like, no, we're not in a position to do that. We've seen a little bit with this social science one, having to build differential privacy into a platform. It's hard. But if I'm a government, I would argue that there is a way that data can be shared to simply say, show us not the algorithm, but what's the output of some of your algorithms. Similarly, at the moment, we see, um, you know, 
different people. For example, Mark Zuckerberg talking about we've got new transparency measures. Now, if I right now try and use that Facebook ad library API, it is an utter disaster. I cannot hold those ads accountable because I cannot monitor them because the API does not give me the information that allows me to do that. What That's is, a fundamental problem. And say, say more about that. What is the information that it's not it's not giving? So it's buggy, but also if I wanted to say what ads right now are running in Tallahassee and are they targeting people of colour? Is there a voter suppression campaign happening right now? I cannot do that. I can search by state, but I cannot search by those demographic categories beyond gender and age. Like that's, I don't think that's good enough. It's not legible, in other words, for research. Yes. And so my concern is these governments have been putting more pressure on the technology companies. We have had more transparency mechanisms, but actually, you know, Macron isn't testing the Facebook API. We have not good transparency measures, yet they're allowed to tick a box. And as I often say, they are marking their own homework right now. They write the transparency reports to say, we promise you we're doing better. That's not it's not viable. And so I want the governments to work with the technology companies to get access to some of these data to really have an ability to show whether or not these changes that are being promised, are they making a difference? That still puts this ad library approach, uh, the ad transparency system, still puts responsibility on society yeah. to monitor how much harm is there. Yeah. And the problem is, like, does society, does the not do the nonprofit civil society groups have even the resource? Like, first of all, why did they sign up for that job anyway? Is like, why should we have to have an ecosystem? Like, it's like we created all this work for people to just review how bad. It's like a gun manufacturer who's like, we're going to provide reports every quarter on exactly how many people our guns have killed. We don't need transparency reports. We need systems that don't kill people. Yeah. And we need systems that don't target vulnerable populations. Now, the question is, what does that look like? And again, I I think that in Western markets, things like the Ad Transparency API has some basic level of scrutiny from journalists and so on. I think that's it's better than not having it. But that's assuming that there is this kind of fourth estate that's monitoring the things that are going on in countries like Cameroon or, you know, Kenya or whatever. How many organizations are looking at the Ad Transparency API? Well, they don't have it. I mean, Australia doesn't have the ad library. Oh, they don't. So they went through an election. It's certain countries, and you can imagine which countries have them. They are countries that have put more pressure on the tech platforms to say we require transparency. But Australia had an election last year. We worked there. We've got a bureau in Sydney. We couldn't do the work that we were doing in the UK. And what was the cost of not having that transparency? A, A complete black box. You know, that's that's the problem. And so, of course, we could we don't have to have a long conversation now about whether Facebook is correct to say we're not going to fact check those ads. But it is not correct to say that we have transparency methods that allow others to check whether mm-hmm. or not. When in, during the UK election, for example, uh, we found that um, one of the parties, the Conservatives, 88 percent of the ads they were running were using content that had been labeled as misleading by the fact checker full fact. 88%. 88%. And that was yes. because we had downloaded the content, worked with journalists and said, this is problematic. Well, so let's imagine 88% of ads running in Sydney based on misleading claims and Facebook isn't checking it and no Australian journalist can check it. Like, it's just not If those not are the acceptable. numbers, 88% in the UK and we know in Brazil, 89% there, like this does not look good. I mean, if we don't have the data, we don't need more transparency that says how bad is the like 90%, 95% rates in these other countries. We need to shut it down. What I'm curious about is, let's say five years from now, it's 2025, and we've transitioned to a humane technology future. We've reversed out of this sort of like heading towards a dark age where people don't know what's true. What in the period of that five years, what happened? What did we do? What did governments do? What did Facebook do? What did we as a society do? Uh, this is such a great question. Um, we took it seriously. And by taking it seriously, we slow down. We will add a ton of friction into the system that will stop our basest instincts just sharing without trying. And what does that friction look like, for example? So the great work by Nathan Matthias, uh, who's now at Cornell, who's shown that the more you ask people, are you sure this is true before you share it, the more you put delays in, or, I mean, you, limiting the number of people you yeah, can reshare something all this, to all the stuff that we know, giving more credibility. You know, for example, on if you have heuristics about where this information came, you're more likely to like, oh, are you sure um, like, that we have enough evidence now about things that we know? But I think it's about slowing down. If we had more data, we had not rolled out new features without proper testing. There was real work with academics before stuff was tested in the wild. Like, I don't think it's a million miles away from where we 
could get to. The last three years, I've probably gone to 150 convenings about misinformation globally. I think you're the the information disorder conference queen. I've seen you at every single one I've been to. Right. And, uh, you know, and there has been some very good conversations at some of these types of things. But in these last three years, whenever we've talked about this problem is complex, it's going to require a lot of people being involved in the solution. It's going to take time. People are like, yeah, yeah, but we just need Facebook to tweak the algorithm. And we've had three years of people expecting a simple, quick response. One thing I would say in the last six months is there's this recognition of, wowzers, like this is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. It's probably going to take 50 years not to solve, but to get to a state that's more humane and is actually not causing harm. Um, And in order to do that, we need deep education of everybody at every sector. And it's going to require real cultural shifts. I want to walk outside and I want to say, I have faith that the people around me are being embedded in a healthy information environment, slower, more thoughtful, more reflective, more careful, higher friction information environments. My friend Eric Weinstein has this great saying that instead of critical thinking, we're going to need critical feeling. Yeah. That we have to examine our own emotional reactions to the information that is presented to us, and not just information, but to experiences that are presented to us. I'm actually kind of hopeful in this weird way with coronavirus, where we've been in this low-trust, amusement-driven world. Well, you better bet people are going to suddenly be concerned with what's actually true when it comes to the health of your family. Yep. Disinformation works if it taps into fears about your own safety and those of the people you love. And so on this, that's exactly, you can dismiss all this political nonsense, but this is about real harm. You touched a little bit on emotional Mm scepticism and there are great media literacy programs and there's a lot of money that's gone into, oh my God, we've got to like teach the 13 year olds. I think we know now that actually some great research from NYU, it's actually over 60 that are the biggest problem. Mm. But I wish that we could do more to teach people how to talk to one another about this. So we talk about this in training, but for example, if I, you know, go home for Thanksgiving and I'm like, hey, Uncle Bob, uh, couldn't help but notice, posted something on Facebook, um, it's wrong, and here's a Snopes article that proves that you're wrong. This Doesn't is, work so well. No, and we know there's psychological like worldview theory, which is like you double down on your worldview. People feel great when people tell them that your identity is wrong. Yeah, it turns out. <laughs> um, so we we talk in training about how actually like, hey Bob, uh, couldn't help but notice you, you you posted that, but um, I've been thinking a lot about this. Like, why are people trying to manipulate our communities? Like, I'm watching this happen. Like, people are trying to divide us. Like. I, what do you think? Why are people doing this, Bob? And I know that's a very simple explanation, but the language of we and us is not the language that journalists and fact checkers and researchers like to use. Mm. But that, like, we have to be better at teaching one another how to slow it down, how to get people to take responsibility for the information they share. I mean, we, you and I have been talking for how long now? We haven't talked about people, mm-hmm. the users, mm-hmm. and how we are being weaponized. And so we can add flags to Facebook and add more label, all the rest. But actually, if we don't stop my mum or whatever sharing it, then we're in trouble. And we don't talk about that at all. And so teaching people how to reverse image search a picture, yes, fine. How to read a headline, fine. But we haven't talked about the psychology of us. Right. And we should be doing more of that. There's this campaign that It was brought to my attention by someone um, who actually helped create one of the major platforms. But the theoretical name for the campaign was We the Media instead of We the People. Because in this new world of user-generated content, you and I are the journalists now, even though we don't even think of ourselves that way because we are the information ecologists. But instead of someone who went to journalism school, knew the training, know that you have to ask for you know the opposite opinion before you publish the thing, or at least make sure you reach people with corrections, all of those kinds of basic rules, we're not operating with any of those rules. And so when you sort of do the Indiana Jones swap of like, we have this media environment where you had all these people who studied certain norms, standards, ethical codes, producing information with certain flaws, and then you do the Indiana Jones swap into this new environment where it's each of us are now the unpaid gig economy attention laborers who are driving around attention for free using our own vanity and ego and narcissism going to get as much attention as possible. Each of us are essentially the information providers, but we don't have the responsibility or the norms that protect us from making mistakes. So if I do something that's misleading, right, that never shows up on my reputation. Yep. Imagine if like next to your, you know, on Twitter, it shows you the number of followers someone has, the number of the people that they follow. What if it had like the sort of responsibility score? People aren't going to like this. Sounds like China. But if you imagine <laughs> there is some notion we could agree on some set of values and that set of values would accumulate into a reputational score, like a credit score. Yeah. But 
not based on true or false, but just here are some standards, some open standards for, I don't know what those things would be. This would be kind of a, we work it out in real time. Like how would technology adapt to support something like that? Because you can imagine that being built into the design of products. Yeah. I mean, I say this sometimes, which is, you know, 30 years ago, we could be at a party and you could be very drunk and I could let you get into the car and go. And I'd say to my friend, oh, I hope Tristan gets home all right. Now I would have to take the keys away from you because society has said, I cannot knowingly let you get into a car drunk because that's not appropriate for society. Mm -hmm. With this, how do you say, wow, like Brian, like last week you posted at least three false things on on Twitter. Like it's kind of embarrassing, mate. Mm -hmm. Like we have to, I think we have to as society say, we have to take responsibility for what we share. And again, I use this sometimes when it seems simple, but like littering, like every time somebody shares something on Twitter that's false, they're like, oh, it's like throwing a can of Coke out the window. What's the worst? Somebody's going to pick it up. We have to say, yeah, but if we all do that, we're in trouble. And I think we just haven't, we, because I think the audience has been completely absent in these conversations. You go to any of these convenings, like, what can the government do? What can the platforms do? What can educators do? Yep, it's like, how, we have to take some responsibility. And right now, I don't think there is any responsibility placed on us. I think the reason people like myself, we often turn to the technology platforms to say, you've got to fix this, is because they operate at scale. The tech platforms are are the vehicles by which you would distribute this education. So if you were running Facebook right now, I know people ask you this all the time, or you're running Twitter or YouTube, what would be the way you would use that distribution vehicle to even enhance personal responsibility? So I, the, the worry about, hey, Bob, you shared three false things last week, is it's really difficult. We don't have the AI systems right now to be able to automate that process. And a lot of this stuff is the gray stuff. So it's actually harder to do. But I mean, a couple of years ago, the Guardian newspaper started adding yellow labels to say, this is from 2014. I loved that. Yeah, it's a great example. It's like such a simple intervention. And so... Of course, there's a lot of hoo-ha about would labels work? Maybe they're going to backfire, blah, blah, blah. But there is research now that actually the satire label would make a difference because mm. there's 82 different satirical sites around the world. How many do you know? Probably The Onion. Right. Like the absence of those heuristics means that Bob, you can't really blame Bob if he's, nobody's helping him here. Mm -hmm. but if we build in friction, we add context, um, then I think... We do that, the Google meta tags thing so that they can publish the article with the headline that's about the truth instead yeah. of the false thing, but the false thing still can get picked up. Yeah, all, all those kind of extra things. And a lot of this is how can we research in real time whether or not this is having unintended consequences. So, I mean, the label thing I'm really obsessed with at the moment, we're partnering with Partnership on AI for a research fellow for six months to say, can we have a universal visual language around manipulated media? So when the drunk Nancy Pelosi video appeared, some people called it manipulated, some people said doctored, some people said transformed. Like, as an audience, I don't really know what's happening here. So can we have a joint visual language that doesn't say that's a bad video, but we are in some way saying there's been an addition. Like, how can we help the audience know what's happening and so I'm interested in not media literacy campaigns or education, but how can that be baked into the platform in useful ways? I love this. I mean, we, I think it was five years ago, I had a side project that instead of fact checking, we called it frame check. I think we do need as an industry, a common language and vocabulary on just what is the difference between the word distorted versus manipulated? What's the difference between to steer, to guide, to persuade, to influence, to seduce? They're on different dimensions of the degree of control that you have and the degree of asymmetry between one party and the other. How much does one know about the other party's manipulation? We need this common language for the subtler terrain of how the mind is being influenced and persuaded. And this would be a great thing to have baked into the common tech industry because I do think it's almost like a missing component. We want to kind of import this sort of subtle human mind, humane framework for how we work. Yeah. And I mean, all jokes aside, I did my PhD back in 1999 in communication and everyone's like, oh, Mickey Mouse degree, Claire. And now I'm like, turns out <laughs> it was all this. It was all about framing, priming, agendas, all that stuff. And I'd, th I'd say, you know, bad actors, although I don't really like that phrase, but they are really good at psychology and emotion. Really good. To your point about uh, disinformation, that all these kinds of strategies have a kernel of truth. So with voter suppression, I'm not saying don't vote today. I'm saying, oh, the lines are long today. Is it wrong to say the lines are long today? The lines are, I mean, what is long? What's the official definition of long? Is yeah. it, you know, two miles long? Is yeah. it like a long? 
it's all arbitrary, but I'm creating a suggestion that maybe might be kind of hard. And if, if you're feeling kind of busy today, maybe it's not worth voting. Yeah. Yeah. And that subtle ability to persuade, I'd love to see a full on cultural transformation, both in journalism and media and in technology and anyone working in the field of communications where we stop talking in the language of speech and we start talking in the language of subtle cognition. Yeah. And the, those of us who are pushing quality information, we are dreadful at it. Right. We're rational. We're all about facts. And it is an asymmetrical playing field. I actually did a, a talk last week at the uh, National Academy of Sciences, and it was the ugliest slide deck I've ever created because I basically just created meme after meme after meme. And I said, this is how your adversaries talk to each other. And, and this is how you talk. Here's your 187 page PDF with an image of a dripping needle on the front cover like that's not how this works and of course there was laughter around but there you know there was a recognition afterwards which was like we're really bad at communicating and just the other day the who put out a, a kind of a leaflet about coronavirus and they did exactly what you're not meant to do which is like myth 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 in big letters and then underneath in small letters the truth Right. I mean, you should never include the like. It's just well, I, it's the I don't, whole thing is that you're doing a lie sandwich. We are doing the lies more often. How than doing are the we truth. in 2020 in the middle of a coronavirus crisis? A WHO who are an amazing organization who hasn't taught them how to effectively push out this kind of information using emotion, but in a way that's compelling, not dumbing down. But like, it's, yeah. it's crazy to me. Claire, before we we go, um, what can people do to help your work? I know that you uh, are on the ground on the front lines of these things. I know that psychologically it's hard. I know that as a lifestyle it's hard. I know, like you, we probably lose a lot of sleep. What what kind of support do you and the organizations that you're most uh, you know working with need help with? I think particularly people who listen to this kind of podcast. I think there has been this creation of this divide between the tech press and the platforms, which means that understandably there's this kind of like rejection of wanting to partner and work together. And my sadness here is that there are many of us who work on the ground around the world who really have got things to offer. And I think sometimes just, uh, just sometimes a quick phone call or just coffee or break like i just love some moments there which is without signing an nda nobody's trying to get a gotcha moment of journalism that's one thing and i think the other thing is to recognize that this work is um you know just let's just talk about it for a second i mean i spend the majority of my time fundraising as opposed to doing what i'd want to do and i say to some people i I feel like we've got two years to save the planet and that sounds crazy and insane and maybe over the top tell tell me why that's true i think people really don't understand that what why was why is it true that we have two years to kind of save this So, I mean, I started doing this work 10 years ago and I would stand in a room with BBC journalists and I'd be like, don't worry too much about this. But just to let you know, during breaking news events, there's a couple of hoaxsters who are probably going to try and manipulate you. That was 10 years ago. Now I stand in rooms with the same journalist being like, you might have gone on hostile environment training previously when you're about to report from the Middle East. I'm about to give you hostile environment training because the way that you work now on the internet, it is a hostile environment. It's a hostile epistemic information environment. And let me tell you how you protect yourself, how to stop yourself being doxxed, how do you stop yourself from being harassed, how you stop yourself from being manipulated. Um, and I see the speed at which this is happening. In two years' time, this country will be fully polarised. We will have two different sets of media. Nobody will believe anything from anybody. And I do think that there are there is still hope, but we cannot keep talking at convenings. We can't keep talking at podcasts about what we're going to do. I mean, we could have done this podcast three years ago and said almost exactly the same thing. And so I don't, you know, we don't need a UN agency for disinformation because that's going to take too long to set up. But we need to work quickly. We need to be agile. We need to, like my sister creating a cross-check project around journalists collaborating when that never happened before you know what do we do at this moment of inflection and I know everybody says this but like what do you want to look in the mirror and see and I just don't think we're taking it seriously enough and I think coronavirus might be the thing that all of a sudden makes people go this isn't a joke yeah. Claire thank you so much for coming on and I'm just a huge fan of your work please keep doing what you're doing and we all support you even if uh, you feel alone sometimes so thank you very much yeah. Your Undivided Attention is produced by the Center for Humane Technology. Our executive producer is Dan Kedmi, and our associate producer is Natalie Jones. Noor Al Samurai helped with the fact-checking. Original music and sound design by Ryan and Hayes Holiday. And a special thanks to the whole Center for Humane Technology team for making this podcast possible. A very special thanks to the generous lead supporters of our work at the Center for Humane Technology, including the Omidyar Network, the Gerald Schwartz and Heather Riesman Foundation, the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, Evolve Foundation, Craig Newmark Philanthropies, and Knight Foundation, among many others. Huge thanks from all of us.